Hello, in this video I'm going to show you a proof that shows that zero does not exist. Obviously this is not a real proof and there is a mistake somewhere in this proof. As you watch this video, see if you can find the mistake and at the very end of the video I will do my best to try to explain where everything falls apart. So we're going to start uh, by writing just the number zero down and we're just going to directly show that it does not exist. So zero is equal to and we're going to use some calculus here so if you don't know calculus I'll do my best to explain. This is equal to the limit as x approaches zero of zero. So what is this? Uh, when you're looking at the limit of zero as x approaches zero you're asking as x gets really, really close to zero, what happens to zero? Well, it's just zero, so it's going to be zero. In general, when you have the limit of a constant, which zero is a constant, you're just going to get a constant. So this is equal to this. And the next step is really interesting. Now we're going to introduce some funny stuff. So we still have the limit sign. So now I'm going to write zero in a clever way. I'm going to write it as one over x minus one over x, just like that. And this is also okay, right? Because I haven't really uh, done anything other than write zero as one over x minus one over x. So if you subtract one over x from one over x, you're just going to get zero. So all of this is okay. And the next step, we're going to break this up into two separate limits. So we have the limit as x approaches zero of one over x, and then minus, so we're gonna bring down the minus, and then we have another limit, right? Just breaking it up using properties of limits, approaches zero, of one over x, just like that. So just breaking up uh, the limit of a difference into two separate limits. And so now we're going to uh, try to think about what these limits are. So I'm gonna come down here and do a little graph for you. So there's the y-axis and there's the x-axis. And we're gonna look at the graph of a uh, one over x, y equals one over x, and then here's the y-axis. So this graph has two asymptotes. It's got a vertical one here, and it has a horizontal one here. And it looks roughly like this. This is a pretty rough picture here, and like this. And so when we're trying to evaluate the limit as x approaches zero, we have to think about what happens to the graph uh, when x gets really close to zero. So we can do that by thinking of what's called one-sided limits. So if we look at um, the limit from the right, so as x approaches zero from the right, you see the arrow here is me indicating that x is approaching zero, the y value goes up uh, forever, it shoots off to infinity. So the limit as x approaches zero from the right of one over x, well, it's going up forever, so that's equal to infinity, okay? In this case, we would say the limit does not exist, but infinity is just a more accurate description of what's happening, so we write infinity rather than does not exist. Now let's look at the limit as x approaches zero from the left of one over x. So again, approaching zero from the left, what happens to the y values of the graph? Well, as x gets closer and closer to zero from the left, the y values get infinitely small, so we say that they are approaching negative infinity. In this case, the limit also does not exist, except we write negative infinity because it's the more descriptive option. So whenever you write infinity and negative infinity, those limits still don't exist. It's just we're being more descriptive. We're trying to describe the behavior of the function in a better way. So because this one approaches infinity and this one approaches negative infinity, what do we do for the regular limit or the two-sided limit? Well, in this case, we really can't say anything about this. So this limit here, this limit here, the limit as x approaches zero of one over x, 
This limit does not exist, so we write that as d and e. But neither does this one, so none of this makes sense. So none of this exists. So this does not exist. So we have just shown using calculus that the number zero does not exist. And that means that the world will implode upon itself, whatever that means, or that there is a fatal flaw in this really simple argument. And there is a fatal flaw, and it's a very instructive flaw. Out of all of the little trick problems out there in math that show that one is equal to two, that pi is equal to zero, in my opinion, this is probably the most instructive one. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you right away what the mistake is. The mistake is right here. You are not allowed to do this because you're going from something that doesn't make sense to something that makes sense. You may say, wait a minute, we went from here, from the bottom up. It's gotta go both ways, it's an equality, right? So you're also going from the bottom up, right? Not from, rather, we went from the top down, but you have to think about it going the other way too. From this step to the step above it uh, has to make sense, and it doesn't, because neither of these exist. If you recall from calculus, if you've taken calculus, or maybe you will be taking it, there is uh, a statement that says if, if you have a limit as x approaches c of f of x, and this exists, in other words, it's equal to a number, and if you have the limit as x approaches c of g of x, and that also exists, in other words, it's equal to a number, then what happens is you can look at the limit as x approaches c of the sum and difference, so f of x plus or minus g of x exists. So if the individual pieces exist, so if the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists, and the limit of g of x as x approaches c exists, then the sum and difference also exists. But that's not what we did here. Right here, we had two limits that uh, did not exist, and we went to something that exists, so you can't do that. You might think, well, wait a minute. Uh, this is saying that if this exists, then the individual ones exist. That is not true. This is an if-then statement, so it only goes one way. Again, if the individual limits exists, then the sum and difference exists. If the sum and difference exists, there's not necessarily true that these exist. In fact, in this example, we showed that even though, even though this is 100% equal to zero, this does not make any sense, right? None of this makes sense. So just because uh, you have uh, something that exists as a whole doesn't mean that the separate pieces are going to exist. The separate pieces must exist, and then and only then can you combine them into a single piece and say it exists. So hopefully that made some sense. Um, it's a really crucial uh, idea, especially if you do any type of uh, proofs. If you take a class uh, called advanced calculus, uh, or sometimes it's called real analysis, this is one of those things that you can easily misuse this and, and mess up in your proofs. In fact, that's where I learned this. I learned this uh, in an advanced calculus 2 class. Uh, and I remember the day I learned this, uh, looking at the board and being in awe and thinking, oh no, my homework is wrong. <laughs> so hopefully this video has shown you that zero does exist, right? Because you know zero does not exist is a false is, is a false statement. So zero does exist, and hopefully you've learned a, a little bit of calculus. I hope this video has been helpful, and maybe now you can show it to other people and see what they think. Good luck.